Hello and welcome to this episode of the Sustainability Story podcast presented to you by CFA Institute and the recently formed Research and Policy Center at CFA Institute. I am Andres Vinelli, Chief Economist at CFA Institute, and today I am joined by Harriet Waters, a Charter Environmentalist and the Head of Environmental Sustainability at the University of Oxford in the UK. Harriet leads the environmental sustainability team that is in charge of reducing carbon emissions from the university state, implementing engagement programs for both staff and students, and providing leadership in sustainability matters in general. And Harriet has gratefully agreed to share with us the highlights stemming from the university's journey into the realm of sustainability and to explore the lessons learned that could be useful for other organizations. Harriet, thank you for joining us. Oh, that's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me on. Well, pleasure. It's, it's all mine to host you. And perhaps before we delve into Oxford's sustainability strategy, I would like to learn a little bit more about your own personal journey into environmental issues. Harriet, how did you become involved in this field to start with? Oh, thanks. That's a great question. So I was a teenager in the 80s when there was media focus on environment, which I think happens on quite a cycle. I think it probably happens every 12 years is what I'm noticing from my lifetime. And Greenpeace were a huge and it was really kind of cool to be into environmental issues. And I was doing science-based higher exams, so our A-levels in the UK. So I was doing maths, physics and chemistry. And I was searching around to work out what kind of degree I could do. And environmental science seemed to fit with those choices of mine, but also felt like it was something that I was really passionate about. So I went into university to do an environmental science degree. Interestingly, it wasn't the easiest thing to find that degree. And I think there's, again, in the degree offering in environmental science kind of waxes and wanes. So there's some universities in the UK that have been doing this kind of offering that kind of degree for years and are really well known, others less so. And that was interesting. So I did a, my degree in environmental science, was really sure that that's where I want the field that I wanted to work in, but then realized it was quite hard to get a job there. So, and the other thing, the other really ironic thing was trying to get a job in my, my particular field, which I, which, that I thought I was going to go into was going to be air pollution because that's what I did my dissertation on at an undergraduate level. To get a job in air pollution without being able to drive was almost impossible. And I didn't drive because I was an environmentalist. So I went on to do a master's course, again, more environmental stuff. And eventually got employment from in a consultancy that was working with community groups, but also with businesses as a very early career move. And then moved into doing advice for ethical investors. So the kind of people like Triodos Bank and Cooperative Banks so are ethical banking systems in the UK. I was doing research behind that. So that meant reading environmental reports that were put out by corporates which was really interesting, but also incredibly frustrating reading those reports and not having it had anything to do with it myself. So the next move that I wanted to make was doing something that was a lot more tangible. Uh, and luckily enough, I got an offer of a job with a university trying to make a university more sustainable. Uh, that was 20 years ago. So that's not all been at Oxford University, but that's been my journey. It, very interesting because perhaps you were a pioneer. I, I did. I do remember for the, those times, you know, Greenpeace. It was very public, and and you know, I remember the a lot of action on on whales and, and and all that. But but it took some time for that to click into into action at different levels of of society, right? And and you were a pioneer in there. So tell me about. Why did Oxford need you and your expertise, and what what's what is the sustainability strategy that that Oxford has? Oh, it's it's a lovely story about Oxford having a, more, a bigger sustainability team because there has been for a long time people working in this kind of part of the university, but a very small number of people, and there's also been a. Um, a, there's a long history of there being committees at the university to talk about this kind of issue. But something very 
kind of pivotal that happened in 2009 was the students did a huge campaign to the university to ask them to appoint somebody uh, of a more senior level that was going to oversee environmental sustainability. And they did that in February and did it in the form of sending the university a Valentine's card and asking them to love the planet a little bit more and recruit a head of environmental sustainability. So the university listened to that and and took action on that and appointed somebody um, who did a great job. Uh, and then I was the second incumbent of that role. Um, I, when I got to the university, there were five of us in our team working on environmental sustainability, but it was still there was still very much a desire for us to do more um but we didn't i guess the university didn't really know what that more would be so i started off by first of all building the team a bit but also um working on our existing carbon targets so at that point we had set a carbon target of a 33% reduction by 2020 and that's not uncommon for in British universities. There was um, a funding body that made it a requirement of getting some funding that universities had a carbon reduction target. And Oxford had been great at setting a target, but they hadn't been great at the actual delivery of projects. So um, that's, I think that's part of the reason that I was taken on because I'd already been working at a neighbouring university, Oxford Brookes University, and had this experience of being able to work on sustainability and deliver projects. Love the um, the, the Valentine's uh, card. And w would you consider that, that, when did that happen? And was that sort of a pivotal moment for what unfolded next? Yeah, I mean, that was around about 2009. And um I think whenever there's kind of student pressure, it can be a pivotal time. Um, and I think it's a bit like the cyclical nature of environment in the media that uh, those protests that can then have consequences or they can change direction or they can up the, the activity going on. And that doesn't mean that every protest equals a change in policy. But if you can really point to a increasing... Um, community of people that want change, then I think universities are beautifully placed to be able to take on that message. Uh, they're very good at taking on the message. I think the universities then find it quite hard to in, in, pl implement the change, uh, but they will do it eventually. They're not as agile as your general organization, uh, but they will do, they will make good changes. Right. And, and the universities, like many other public or non profit organizations struggle different with different goals uh, in in mind. So, uh, so you probably need some organizing principles and then a good plan of action. So, what are the the main organizing principles or pillars of the strategy? Fourteen years later, uh, after that Valentine's card. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, we adopted our sustainability strategy in twenty twenty one with these two overriding goals of a net zero carbon and a net gain in biodiversity by 2035. Uh, so those are our, you know, our top line goals, but they're supported by four different enablers, which are governance. So making sure we've got the correct decision-making uh, framework set up with the institution, reporting on what we've done, and that for us, that means that we are now reporting our carbon and biodiversity data within our financial statement alongside our finance data. Uh, the third is all around uh, funding because this stuff isn't going to happen without some funding. And then the fourth for completeness is offsetting. But we say within our strategy that we don't intend to offset until at least 2030. Uh, but we, we know that we will have to offset. I think we've had to conclude that however fast we would like to go, some of our buildings are going to be very difficult to decarbonize. So setting ourselves up with a strategy that's impossible is not helpful. So offsetting is included in there. Uh, so those are the pillars. And then we have, our, we have 10 uh, kind of focus areas, which are the kind of things that you'd expect in an environmental sustainability strategy like food and travel, uh, but because we're a university, we include research and curriculum. 
Absolutely. And many of us um, here in the audience uh, and at CFA Institute are very interested in, in reporting. Traditionally, that's financial reporting, but this day it's so much more. Uh, so you mentioned that alongside financial data, you, you are reporting on, on carbon and I take it on biodiversity uh, too, if I hear you correctly. Could you tell us a little bit more about what reporting uh, en encompasses and who is the ultimate uh, audience for that reporting in your mind? Yeah, so at the moment, our reporting includes uh, all of our scopes of carbon, so our directly emitted carbon and our indirectly emitted carbon. And if there is any activity to kind of offset those emissions. So what that means in kind of more lay terms is that we're reporting our scope one emissions, which are generally our consumption of gas, but also the vehicles that we own, but it's de minimis in a university situation. Our scope two emissions are our electricity consumption. Um, but at the moment, we can net that consumption off because we buy uh, renewable certificates so we buy from renewable sources and then our scope three emissions which are all about the emissions that are indirect but they come through areas such as the supply chain so if you're thinking about a university context that's likely to be from activities such as construction and our scientific equipment activity uh, and travel that we do so we've we have, we're kind of at the beginning of our journey on scope three emissions, but we have already identified our probable three biggest areas. So though that data is within the financial statement uh, with our kind of tons of carbon dioxide. And we've now got three years of data that we can, that we've, we're posting, we plan to post this year of what our carbon emissions are. So you can see, begin to see emerging trends. Um, Biodiversity is slightly harder to describe and has been a bit of a moving feast because we are very much, I'd say, at the cutting edge of being able to describe what our impact is on biodiversity. And this has been a huge kind of discovery in the work that we did to develop our strategy. I think previously to the strategy work, we used to think that biodiversity was just about the green spaces on our estate. And we weren't really thinking about the biodiversity impact that we have through our supply chain. But now that we've actually done some measurement, it's much the same story as it is with carbon. So our scope one and two is not that big. Our scope three is about 10 times bigger at best estimates. And it's much the same in biodiversity. So although we have, you know, we have these beautiful green gems on our campus, we have a white and woods, which is the most um, surveyed or examined set of woods that you will ever come across and we have botanic gardens we have an arboretum we're very lucky but that really pales into significance if you think about the it that we're using the mobile phones that we use that have got things like precious metals in that really have a contribution towards global biodiversity and how we do something about that so it's been quite a fascinating journey it's very interesting because the bio biodiversity side of things it's it's perhaps emerging and it's it's very complex, almost by by definition. And I'd be very interested to, to know how how you're going ab about it, right? When when you're thinking about say an arboretum that may or may not have um, it, the native species and other uh, species of interest for a variety of reasons. How how do you think about? about that and perhaps trading off any other goals because I presume the Arboretum had, you know, initially was not conceived as a biodiversity um, experiment because uh, we were not talking <laughs> about those things presumably when, when, when that happened. So how do you think about, about that? Yeah, I mean, you're right. It's very much an emerging area and therefore the, probably the easier area to think about is your direct impact much the same as carbon. So we can look at the different green spaces we've got. We can look at opportunities to increase green space. We're very lucky in the UK in that, from my point of view, we're lucky in that there's legislation coming in that will um, will require us as developers to improve biodiversity on development projects. So that's incredibly helpful. 
And those kinds of areas we'll need to make more systematic. We're building a, a pipeline of biodiversity projects, which will be measured against biodiversity increase, but also by addition, other uh, improvements. So much like a carbon type project decision tree, you'd say, okay, this is the carbon improvement, but this is the likelihood that it'll work, or this is the availability of the space, or this is additional other uh, benefits that we don't really, we hadn't really thought about, which might be reduction in maintenance. In a biodiversity field, it could also be reduction of maintenance, but it could also be in improvement to mental health or access to leisure, etc. So that's the more straightforward area. <laughs> and then in the indirect biodiversity uh, arena. I mean, a very, uh, whilst we're thinking about it, um, a, a kind of direction of thought that we have at the moment is that anything that we do on our climate emissions also contributes towards improving global biodiversity. So as long as we're doing something on climate, we will be contributing towards reducing our biodiversity impact. But that's while we figure out, I think, what we can actually do. So we need to be thinking much and involving systematically more of a circular economy. So how can we make our, I mean, the things I, re, I referenced earlier, our IT kit and our mobile phones work long, last for longer so that we're having less of an impact? Or how can we make sure that those kinds of resources that we're using are from renewable components or recyclable components and we're really reducing the waste that we produced? and really being aware of the impact that we make. So the key thing is getting some data. So it's data-based decisions. And, you know, the data will be imperfect for a long time. Yeah, I think that's a reality, but but it's helpful to, to look at this uh, from a systems perspective in that you, you can think that, that green areas in, uh, in general have been shown to, to produce health benefit to us humans. Uh, there's something about that that clicks with our imprint, right? Our DNA, and uh, so it's it's very hard to to just address one issue in in this area. You are doing a lot more than than that, um, and this complex set of of, of considerations um, are interesting but hard to communicate sometimes. And I'm wondering. What, uh, how do you work on this uh, scope three um, issue where you're dealing with with suppliers that are perhaps very much away from from the university setting? And how do you go about engaging them, uh, measuring? Do you use consultants? Do you use specialists or you use people in house? How do you go about that relationship? Yeah, so there's a few different ways. And I suppose we I think of scope three data in three different uh, areas or three different levels of quality. So the, the lowest quality scope three data is all about the spend that you do in a certain category. And uh, we've got existing UK emission factors for each category of spend. But it's as soon as you start thinking about that a little bit, it becomes a real nonsense. So, you know, you've got an emissions factor for construction spend, and then you start spending more money on construction because you've come across a sustainable product, but you're happy to absorb that cost. That then increases your scope three emissions. doesn't make any sense. So we're well aware that that's not the, a good bit of quality data, but it's also used as a kind of ready reckoner so that you can understand where your biggest impacts might be. Um, and then that's the least the least good quality. Then the best good quality would be if you've got a supplier that uh, has really done its own deep dive on its carbon data and can tell you exactly what the carbon is attached to its product. And again, legislatively, there's requirements for that coming in in Europe. Um, so hopefully that will extend to a lot of our suppliers as well. And of you know, thousands of suppliers, we have a handful that are already doing that. And that's really exciting. And we're just about to start talking to them in more detail about how we can take what they've done and extend it to other suppliers or 
also asks them whether or not they're doing the same for other universities. And then I leave that a kind of middle section of Scope 3 data. Um, so we're just about to start on a project with um, nearly 30 other UK universities where they're going to be reaching out to suppliers and making it as easy as possible for them to talk to us through a platform saying, so if they've done their carbon footprint, we collect their carbon data and then we, we do um, a proportional uh, calculation. So it's a proportion of their turnover that uh, we spend with them and then apply that to their carbon emissions. So again, it's still on the spend, but it's much more, it's much uh, more accurate than the lowest quality data. And then if it's a supplier that's not done any of this work, the platform has a toolkit in there to help them to identify their carbon emissions and their footprint. And it gives them some kind of real basic uh, starter suggestions for action, which is really exciting when you're thinking about small and medium sized enterprises that just have not had the time to do this. They're really keen to keep a client on that's in the higher education sector. But by doing this project, the higher education sector is helping them to have more awareness of their carbon emissions. It, that's a fascinating initiative, and I presume it's very helpful for businesses, especially small businesses that are interested in doing the right thing, but standards are not fully there, the typologies are not always uh, there, there are diverging ones, and there might be conf confusion there. So, so uh, basically putting together a common platform it's very helpful for for every all parties in, uh, involved i think um is this a platform available uh to to the public or is this something that you you're uh, managing directly with businesses so it, at the moment it's just being managed directly with businesses and i think this is a pilot for our sector um but i know that the this is a this is a example where we are working with consultants and I know that the consultants have worked with other sectors as well. So um, they've got lots to bring to the table in saying, you know, this, you think this is complicated because you're a sector that hasn't really done it, but we know we've got experience from other sectors and it's not as complicated as you think. Fantastic. And we, we look forward when, when we folks are ready to, to, to hear about what you learn and what other uh, inst similar institutions can can learn from 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 that. Uh, that that's terrific. I'm wondering um, what's been the interplay between uh, the university's decisions in this area and public policy. And you mentioned legislation. I know that there's tar government targets, say for electricity. Um, how how are those two two actions? Uh, working with each other, are the unit are you is the university providing leadership that is ahead of the targets, or is it coming at the same pace of what the targets uh, are in that area? And uh, predictably, I'll say it depends. But I think the great thing about being higher education is that you often have the ability to access people who are advising the government on the targets that they're likely to set. So often we know about something way before it's going to come into legislation. So we can at least get ourselves organized around the principle that we think will come in um, and then have a kind of, you know, practice run uh, before the legislation's actually there. But that doesn't mean that that will happen on every single bit of legislation. And so there's there will be some legislation that we haven't really had much awareness of that we will have to then kind of um, work quite quickly to apply. But that's the great nature of higher education because we're not because um, we're not businesses and we don't really we don't have much concern about protecting our kind of administration processes. We're great at sharing with each other how we're going to approach different bits of legislation and what are, you know what's a good way of doing it and what what's good practice in the sector and how that can help others obviously research and and, and teaching are core activities to to uh, to a university particularly a a globally you know respected uh leading uh research university so how are the plans uh, and the activities informed by 
research and many of your professors are subject matter experts on this and different aspects of it. Uh, I presume one of them is they're a great raider for what's coming, as you, uh, as you mentioned. Um, but in which other ways are you involving uh, thought leaders in, that you have in faculty? Yeah, so we're really lucky in that the committee that oversees the environmental sustainability work is very academically led. And we have cross-university representation, but we also have kind of disciplinary representation as well. So if we know we've got a question on food, there'll be someone on our, our committee that can speak to that, but can also then draw on a huge number of researchers that they, they have a network for. Uh, and it might be that we've got a particular thorny issue. So actually food's a great example where we would purposefully set up a focus group or a working group. And we're very likely to get a massive spectrum of views of, you know, the university ought to go uh, 100% plant-based tomorrow to uh, regenerative farming's got a really big role to play. Uh, we ought to do this slowly so that we bring people along with us. And it's those kinds of conversations that are then... Um, taken in but then reflected upon by our committees that means that we can come up with uh, a, a suggestion that makes sense to the majority of people but of course when you're working in that kind of way it's kind of a very democratic way of working it can mean that what you churn out at the end seems lame to some people lame was a word that was used against one of our targets once on twitter and um just going way too fast to others. <laughs> <laughs> well, the professors are, are great debaters. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think that, that, um, that you have some leadership, um, le leadership um, uh, accolades in, in herding uh, all these different cats, perhaps, if I may. Um, how about the, 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 the other aspect of the university, the teaching? Right, the educating. Uh, are the plans, the sustainability uh, plans, affected by teaching? How do you look at that? Yeah, so that's tackled in lots of different ways in lots of different institutions. And it was one that it was very hard to get any traction on in our institution because of the great importance of teaching and research. It's not really the right thing to be trying to influence that from my position. I mean, I'm, a, you know, I'm in estate services. We think about the running of the buildings. So who am I to have an opinion about curriculum? Um, but I think it's been very useful that other institutions have done a more, ha have grasped this issue earlier than us and we can see what's happened in those institutions. So I think there's a bit of a split really between institutions that decide this is going to be a requirement for every course in the future that there has to be a sustainability section. And those that say, you know, this is something that you could start thinking about and work with the willing. And we would definitely come into the latter of those descriptions. So, and it's a very Oxford way really to build a coalition of the willing and to uh, showcase the really good practice that could go on around the institution. But having said all that, it's been announced within our institution that in order to broaden the curriculum for our students, so our, our science students so solely focusing on science and our humanities students never thinking about numeracy, for example, that we are going to be, there's going to be something called the Vice Chancellor's Colloquium, which is due to start next year. And within that colloquium, it is this broadening of the curriculum that will be available to students. And the theme that has been chosen for the first one is going to be climate. So I see that as an incredible opportunity. And I hope we do some, fa well, I'm sure we will do some fantastic case studies on that. Um, but then, and then put it alongside the other existing ones that I know of other institutions that do things like, you know, their students come in at the beginning of their time at university and spend a day on sustainability issues so it teaches them problem solving skills there's lots of different ways of introducing sustainability into a university experience and it doesn't have to be an examined curriculum but I think it's that beauty of the higher education ecosystem that it will be done in lots of different ways for quite some time 
And that can then become a differentiator for students making choices about their universities. But I'm not sure it'll be top of the list just yet. Pat, interesting. And, and talking about not top of the list, I, I, I want to go back to, to a comment I thought I heard from you on on carbon offsets, then the, and I think you mentioned that you you weren't using those. So I'd be interested in what the thinking was in that in that area, Harriet. Yeah. So one of the things that I very quickly concluded when we started doing our discussions about the strategy was that we could just talk about offsetting uh, because there's such a variety of views across our community that it can be something that we go around in ever increasing circles rather than ever decreasing circles and very very helpfully Oxford put out a uh, kind of guidance paper um, about offsetting at the same time that we were developing the strategy and in that referred to the fact that although there's a need for offsetting institutions should be concentrating on the on the emissions that they control first so offsetting should be a last resort not the first thing that you do so we we built that ethos into our strategy that we weren't going to be doing offsetting until we absolutely had to because we really need to focus on reducing the emissions that we've got more control over so that's why we're not doing it straight away um there'll be some bits of offsetting still going on across the university because of existing setups but they won't they won't be at all material um and even though we've said we'll start in 2030 we have also said that we're going to start discussing how we do it from 2025 because we think it's going to take us a long time to decide how we do it and what we feel is the most credible and when we were looking at the different options that were available when we were developing the strategy the price comparisons between different types of offsetting that you could do were ridiculous and not something that showed anything, not any, it wasn't anything that seemed particularly defensible for an organization spending public funds. So, uh, and well, and with a charitable status. So do we choose a very expensive offset because we really believe it above a very cheap offset, which is still certified and still to all intents and purposes doing what it says it does so it's just a very difficult time to make a decision it feels like an emerging market and therefore not to sp the, any money that you'd spend on offsetting would be much better spent on reducing your direct emissions terrific and as we move towards the, the end of uh the time for for today um i'd be very interested in learning what you harriet think are some of the lessons learned from from this journey if you have any advice for other institutions, I mean, I, I hear the, some of the learnings as you start at home, right? And you make the change in the, your own institution. Um, and perhaps you eventually you collaborate with peers as you're doing uh, now. So what are the other lessons in this journey of envisioning a plan and then implementing it within a real world set of constraints? Yeah. So it's hard not to get a bit misty eyed, but when I landed my job, I was over the moon and thought, you know, this is the big thing. I've got a job at Oxford University doing something that I'm really passionate about. And um, we had a healthy budget. I was really encouraged to grow the team. I thought it was all going brilliantly. And then it was, it wasn't completely unexpected, but when it was announced in 2019 that we were going to have a more ambitious strategy, it made me reflect that I thought I'd had senior level support and I, I don't think I could say that I hadn't had senior level support, but all of a sudden I had supercharged senior level support and it feels like a bit of, you know, teaching your grandmother to suck eggs. Everyone says you need senior level support. I I had it, but then all of a sudden I had, we were in the spotlight. Everyone wanted to be involved and everyone took it all a lot more seriously. So I think... I think just don't underestimate the power of senior senior level support. I think the fact that we did a wide ranging consultation to come up with the strategy that we got to in the end and so brought a lot of people with us was absolutely crucial. And I think the final one, and that these are none of these are like new new insights, 
is that having targets really helps, especially if you've really documented the logic behind those targets and people understand why you've got those targets. But, you know, it really has lit a fire within Oxford. We've done some fantastic activities since then. So aside of the kind of carbon reduction projects and our biodiversity projects, we had our first ever Green Action Week last year. And all my team really said was, these are the dates of Green Action Week. Before we knew it, there's a stand-up comedian night all about climate. There was a very eminent author that came and spoke in the Sheldonian that students organised. And I think it's just this setting of a framework. Or I feel like we're um, we're gardeners and we make the we make the soil fertile so that amazing things can grow that are planted by the community of Oxford. Well, that's a very fitting analogy, if I may, Harriet. Um, I think that the Valentine love letter to Earth is is now a a letter that is heard around the the world. So thank you for your uh, participation in today's uh, sustainability story, Harriet. Thank you very much. All right. And thank you, everyone, for listening to the sustainability uh, story. Uh, best wishes. Thank you.